The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. I got started on my project by first face planing each of the boards to ensure that I have a good, straight, flat reference surface to work from. Then I moved on over to the surface planer where I thicknessed each of the boards to their appropriate thickness. Finally, I jointed one edge so that it's good and straight as well as square to the faces. Now I'm ready to start laying out the legs for our chest of drawers. We're going to be needing four total legs, each with the same profile. So to help things along a little bit, I'll be making a template out of poster board. And I started out by drawing out the basic straight lines which would be an inch and a half wide and coming down this way and this would be the start of our curve as we sweep out for the foot. Now laying out the two curves for the foot area is relatively straightforward. I've made a mark 26 and 7 eighths of an inch down from the top end of the leg. I then drew a line one and three quarter inches over and then another line four and a quarter inches over and those two points show me where the bottom of the foot will be. Then I've taken what I call a bow, which is nothing more than a string and a thin strip of wood, and then I clamp one end of it to hold tension on that string to get the curvature just right. Then all I need to do is line it up the bow and adjust the curve so that I'm tangent up at this area, and then my curve meets up with my mark down at this point. And with that, I've made my two curve marks. Now I can go ahead and cut out my paper template. The material for the leg blanks is inch and a quarter thick cherry and in this case I'm getting two blanks out of this piece. So I've gone through, jointed one edge, ripped it to width of four and three eighths and cut it off to a length at 43 inches and of course both, both ends are squared up and of course both edges are squared to the face. Then I've just taken my template, lined up the outer edge with the jointed edge on the board and then the foot end up against our squared end. Traced out my outline, flipped the template around, and did the same thing with the foot at the opposite end. Now I'll go ahead at the bandsaw and cut out the two shapes. If you don't have a bandsaw, you should be able to do this with a jigsaw. After the bandsaw operation, I have four nearly identical leg blanks. Now what I'll do is I'll go through and do some sanding on these to further refine their shape. And then we can move on to the machining operations to finish these up. When I sanded all four of my legs, I clamped them together to ensure that they're all the same shape. While I still had them clamped together, I trimmed off the top ends of the legs to make sure that all the four legs are the same length. I've gone through and taken a few minutes to lay out each of the locations for the mortises that we need to machine. Each of our mortises are a half inch wide and one quarter of an inch in from one face. Because of that, it's pretty much just one setup for all of the mortises here at the hollow chisel mortiser. And this machine is about the fastest way to machine your mortises. And of course, if you don't have one, you can always use your drill press to drill out the holes and then chisel the opening square.
Moving on to the rails now, I'll go ahead and start ripping those pieces to width. Now I'm ready to cut off each of my rail sections to their proper overall length. To ensure consistency, I'm using a stop block. We're going to need 10 drawer runners. Those will be 3 quarters of an inch thick, 1 inch wide, and 16 and a quarter inches long. I've already cut off the pieces to length and planed them to thickness. Now all I need to do is rip off some 1 inch strips. strip that I've just ripped is one of two that will be used as the drawer stops at the back of the cabinet and that's ripped to one inch wide as well but it's 22 and 7 8 inches long. Each of our rails will need to have a tenon machined on the end of them. To machine that tenon I'm going to be using a stacked dado head cutter. Now currently I have it set up to three quarters of an inch wide and my rip fence is a quarter inch away from the cutter. So what I'm going to be doing first is machining the tenons on my side rails, which are one inch long. Now the way I'm going to machine this, there's a number of different heights that we have to set the cutter to, but my rip fence remains at a constant position. And to prevent any chance of kickback, what I have to do is machine the end away first, and then I can bump my rail up against the fence and take my final shoulder cut. Take a look, it works pretty easy. to raise my stacked dado head cutter to a half inch high and finish up the other cuts on the tenons. The next machining operation is to machine a series of dados and those will receive the drawer runners. Now we have to machine those dados not only on all four legs but also the two pieces that make up the drawer stops. Now to help with accuracy, I've gone through and laid out the location for each of my dados already. And I'll also be using the rip fence along with the stop lock as a stop to allow for accurate cutting across each of the components. When using the miter gauge with the fence as a stop mechanism, this can create a kickback situation because there will be material trapped between the blade and the fence during this operation. So to prevent any problems, I've of course fixed a stop block that's in front of or closest towards me of the blade. Now of course I have to account for that at each of my rip fence settings. My stop block is one inch so that means I just add one inch to each dimension that we need to machine. just saw we have to trim off each of the ends of our tenons so that they fit together inside those mortises. Now I'm going through fitting up each of my mortise and tenon joints so that they're good and snug and then I'll go ahead for a full dry assembly before committing anything to glue. Well the dry fit's gone real well. I like the way everything fits up nice, everything's good and square, so we're ready for some glue. After getting everything fit up nice and going through the dry assembly, I then went through and sanded each of the surfaces that I won't be able to get to after assembly. And now I'm ready for the assembly. And because this carcass is so important to be square in all dimensions, otherwise the drawers won't work properly, I'm going to be doing the assembly in two uh, stages. I'll start by gluing together the rails and legs for the front and back frames as two separate glue-ups. Once the glue sets up there, then I'll join the two halves, the front and back half, together with the side rails. I'll just be using standard yellow woodworking glue, and I'll apply some in each of the mortise joints, and of course on the tenons, and clamp everything up and check it for square.
and we'll throw a couple clamps on here to hold everything together while the glue dries. After a few minutes, let the glue skin over and then take a sharp chisel and clean away any glue squeeze out that's inside the adjacent mortise. That way there won't be any interference when you join the two front and back halves together. Now that the glue's had a chance to dry for the two face frames, the front and back, I've taken the clamps off and I'm getting ready now to assemble the front to the back using the side rails. And now we can go ahead and start sliding in each of the rails. And we'll throw a few clamps on there to draw everything together good and tight and then I'll check it for square in all three dimensions. After checking the top end for square, I realized I'm out of almost a sixteenth of an inch, so I threw a diagonal clamp on to draw that end into square, and I'll check at the bottom end as well. We're right on the money there. Now it's just a matter of letting that glue have a chance to dry. I'm spreading around a little bit of glue in each of the dados where our drawer runners will be installed. Now when I made my drawer runners, I cut them off about a sixteenth inch too long, so I'll let them stick out in front a little bit extra and in back. Once the glue's had a chance to set up, I'll sand them smooth. With the glue applied in each of the dados, it's just a matter of slipping each of the runners in place. Next, I'll apply some glue along the mating surface for our drawer stop strip which also serves to help hold the drawer runners up against the back legs. Then we carefully sneak it in place. And then we just secure it in place with a couple of clamps until the glue's had a chance to set up. Up near the front of the drawer runner, I'm going to help hold that to the leg using a number six by inch and a quarter long drywall screw. And of course I'll first pre-drill the hole and countersink it. I've already gone through and ripped my corner blocks to width and trimmed them off at a 45 degree angle. To help hold them inside the frame, I'm going to be using pocket hole screws. Now of course you could always drill through and countersink for the screws, but this pocket hole system works real well for this application. I've applied a little bit of glue along each of the two miter cuts. Then I'll just slide it in place. And I want the rails, the top rails, to stand proud of this block by about a thirty-second of an inch. I've gone through all of my bird's eye maple and laid out the location of each of the components for both the drawers as well as the top. Now I'll go through the process of cutting out each of these components using the compound miter saw and the table saw. To join the drawer components together, we're going to be using a special router bit that's called a locking drawer joint and it creates a joint that looks like that. And the, the nice part about this type of router bit is all of this can be accomplished in one setup. Now of course there are a number of different drawer joints that you could use, however I've selected this particular locking drawer joint router bit for our application. This piece here would be considered the front of the drawer. And notice this small area right here. That's three thirty seconds of an inch thick. So we have to account for that when we're cutting off the drawer sides to their proper overall length. Now because I'll be using this joint at both the front and the back, I need to subtract this distance twice from the overall length of the side. So I'll subtract 3 sixteenths, which is 2 times 3 thirty seconds. To set up the router bit, of course I've installed it in my router table with a fence. And I've set it up so that this particular router bit sticks out from the fence a total of a half of an inch. I then raise the router bit up so that it sticks up eleven sixteenths of an inch from the top of the router table. 
Once I have the rough dimension set up on the router bit, of course I use some sample blocks and take some test cuts. Now you pass the front and back drawer panels over the router bit with the inside face down against the surface. So we'd pass that over, the sides of the drawer get passed through up against the fence in a vertical fashion, the inside of the drawer being against the fence. And of course I'll be using a push block when I feed it across. Once I go through my test cuts on the sample pieces and get a good fit, then we're ready to move on to actually machining the drawer fronts, sides, and backs. Using a quarter inch stack dado head cutter, I've machined a groove along the bottom edge of each of the drawer sides, fronts, and backs to receive the plywood bottom. I've gone through and cross cut and ripped all of my plywood bottoms to width for the drawers. Now I'm ready for some assembly. I'll be using standard carpenter's glue for it and I'll apply a little along each of the joints and spread it around with a brush to ensure that I've got good coverage. Then with one of the sides on the workbench I'll slide in the front and back, and then the plywood bottom. Then I'll throw a couple clamps on it, check it for square. The next step on our drawers is to machine a groove to accept the drawer runners. To machine that groove, I'm using a stack dado head cutter. And in this case, it's 3 quarters of an inch wide. Now the groove that we need to machine is 1 inch and 1 32nd, so I know I'll have to take two passes. Now I've raised up my stack dado head cutter to 11 32nd of an inch high, and I've set my rip fence to the appropriate position. Then it's just a matter of taking a cut on each side of the drawer, adjust the fence over, and take the second pass. I've clamped on a backer board on the drawer so that when we feed the drawer over the dado cutter, we don't get chip out near the bottom edge. To make the drawer pulls, I'm going to be starting out with a piece of 3 quarter inch thick cherry that's 3 inches wide by about 16 inches long, and that should be big enough to make all five drawer pulls. Now to machine the relief area for where our fingers need to get behind the front of the pull, I'm going to be using a round nose router bit, and I'm just going to expose about a sixteenth of an inch of that from the fence. I also want the blend where the radius curves around towards the front of the pull to stop about a quarter of an inch away from the front edge of the pole. So that means that I'll have to adjust the height up and down until I get it just right. Here you can see the end profile of my blank that I've just milled with that ball nosed end mill. And you can see that I've cut both faces and both edges. And that allows me to rip these boards a little bit more safely to make these ripping cuts to get our individual pulls, I'm going to set up the fence so that I'm cutting on the far side of the blade. In other words, this is the side that I want to keep. So I'm going to take a scale and measure to get my one inch dimension for the height of the pull, and then I'll lock my rip fence in place. And the reason for that is, if I were to feed through close to this edge, when I'm pushing down with my push stick, the part would rock. Feeding through in this ma manner, I can use the push stick on the flat portion of our blank, and that'll just make the cut a little bit more safe. And it just takes a couple seconds here at the miter saw to cut each of the pieces to length. I've taken a few moments to go through and lay out the locations for our mounting screws for our pulls. And of course they're three inches on center and centrally located along the pole this way. Then I've taken a 3 32nd inch drill bit and installed that in my chuck and set up a couple of stops so that I can make all these cuts very accurately. There, 
that fits up nice. Now what I'm going to go through and do is glue up together the two pieces that will make up the top for our chest of drawers. Now the one thing I'll say is I've ripped it a little bit extra wide and a little bit long. Once I get the gluing all done, I'll then trim it up to its final shape. Now if it makes you feel better, you can go ahead and add biscuits along here, but frankly they're really not needed. To make quick work of sanding my top panel flat, I'll pass it through on my wide drum sander. One pass on each side should do the trick. With the top all sanded flat now, I can go ahead and trim it to width. And now using my shop made panel cutting jig, I can cross cut it to the proper overall length. Around the edge of our top, we need to machine a little rabbit all the way around. And the easiest way to do that is with a rabbiting bit installed in my handheld router. Being rather large in diameter, I'll take my time and move cautiously. And the router makes quick work of that rabbit. I'm going through now and fitting up each of the drawers. Now, of course, it's very important to make sure that when you construct this particular project that everything is square in all dimensions. If you fail to do that, your fit up at this point is going to be very difficult. Now, what I'm going through and doing to get my drawers flush with the front of the frame is I'll sand the back edge of the drawers so that the drawer can go in further against that stop in this area. Then I get it sanded down to the point where the front of the drawer is good and flush with the front of the framework. Once I have that all set up good and flush, or as close as we can get it at that point, I'll then have all the drawers in it, tilt the whole frame on its back, and sand the whole front good and flat. Well, at this point, I've gone through, sanded everything up, softened up all the edges by taking a very fine sandpaper to break the sharp corners, and now I'm ready for some finishing. And of course, being an impatient woodworker, I'll start out by dyeing the cherry to a darker color. To darken the cherry, yet not conceal its beautiful green, I'm going to be using an alcohol-based aniline dye. And the color I'm using is Antique Cherry Brown. Now all I do to apply it is I just wet up a rag, and then I just wipe it on. And of course, you want to try to work with the grain whenever possible and apply it good and even. Being alcohol based, it does dry very quickly. The next step in my finishing process is to apply a coat of tongue oil, sealer, and stain on all of the components. And of course, I'll coat both the inside and outside. When applying it, be sure to wear a respirator and protective gloves. To apply it, I'm just going to use a, a cut-up t-shirt as an applicator pad, apply it liberally, let it soak in for about 10 minutes, wipe off the excess with a dry rag. The next step for my finishing process is to apply two coats of a wipe-on oil and urethane top coat product. To apply it, I'll be using a, a small applicator pad that I've made out of a cut-up t-shirt. I'll be wearing vinyl gloves, a respirator, and of course be sure to use a tack cloth to remove any dust from the surface that you're applying the finish to. Now as I mentioned, I'll apply two coats of this, possibly three if I think it needs a little bit more build. The last step in our chest of drawer construction is to apply a good quality furniture wax to all of the components. And it's especially important to apply it on the drawer runners and the drawer runner sockets on the drawers. If you don't do that, the finish will just wear through in no time at all, and then you'll have a rough sliding drawer. With this wax on here, those drawers are going to glide in and out as if they were on ball bearings. And that'll last for many years at which point you may have to apply a little bit more wax. But don't forget this step, 
or you'll be greatly disappointed in the performance of your project. To fasten the drawer pulls to the front of the drawers, I've already gone through and carefully laid out the location, and now using an 11 inch drill bit, I'll drill the clearance holes for the screws. And now we can just tighten up the screws. With the top and the frame now upside down on top of my workbench, I centered up the frame on the bottom surface of my top. I have the front overextending about three quarters of an inch and centered left to right. Now what I'll do is I'll take a three thirty seconds of an inch drill bit and drill through my four corner braces into the top for our mounting screws. And now with an 11 seconds inch drill bit, I'll drill through the corner block to enlarge that hole. This will allow for movement to the top. There you have it. A maple and cherry, chest of drawers, and a contemporary styling. I know this piece will be passed on through the generations in my family. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.